Let's talk about Bidenomics. President okay. Biden's out there um, trying to make the case that the economy is better than a lot of people think it is. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there's, there's a disconnect between how the administration mm-hmm. sees itself and how a lot of people see the economy. That is true. And our recent polling proves that. I mean, it shows that the vast majority of people do not like the way this president is handling the economy. And as you know, our numbers show, too, the number one thing people are worried about, like 90 percent are concerned about inflation. So while they're out there making this case and it is a full court press, I mean, like several cabinet members, everybody's out there. um, It has translated into real life for most people who still you know, have, you know, all kinds of real world expenses from groceries to gas to rent that have not come down in the way that they would hope. Yeah. I mean, even if they tout, say, wins on um, infrastructure, for example, Mm -hmm. um, having a bridge built isn't helping you right now. Right. Pay your groceries. Like when you go there, you still notice that everything is a lot more expensive than it was a couple years ago. And they'll say, um, rightfully so that inflation is moving in the right direction. But when it hit a 40 year high last summer, I mean, that's nothing to brag about. So, of course, you want to see improvement from that. And who knows? I mean, we're talking about this because we're talking about it and the, the administration's talking about it, but we're a ways away. And it may be more how's the economy in 15 months that may have mm-hmm. more of an effect on the other. Like, there's always been a strong correlation between the economy right before a presidential mm-hmm. election. And the results of that election. Mm -hmm. I suspect that that is probably less so as we become more polarized. I wonder Mm -hmm. if those external factors matter nearly as As much. much. Yeah, Yeah, because they tend – when we're suffering in our own pocketbooks, we tend to punish whichever party is in power and running the White House. So, I mean, we've seen that to be true against Mm -hmm. Democrats and Republicans. Um, But, yeah, the real world stuff does matter. But when we look at our polling, too, and and when you look at things like asking primary voters, why are you voting for the person you're voting for? Is it because of issues and they line up where you are? Or is it because you think they can beat the opponent or you hate the other opponent? So that's why you're showing up. I mean, there are a lot of things that will factor in with the economy, too. Um, Last November, um, those elections, um, the Supreme Court reversing Roe versus Wade got a lot of credit for um, for getting Democrats to come out and vote. And now Democrats are trying to fundraise and rally support on the Supreme Court decision against uh, student loan forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's still there's still an abortion fight going on. But now I think they're trying to Democrats trying to pile on and say, look what this court is doing Mm -hmm. to you. Get out and vote young people. Mm -hmm. And, And we saw it the day of. And I think this administration knew that was probably the decision coming from the Supreme Court. So they had planned their messaging. They knew what they were going to say. And that's it, essentially, is this, quote, MAGA court is stripping away all of your rights and everything good in your life. And so you can't elect presidents who will appoint any more people uh, like the last three that were appointed by President Trump. Now, he's using it to take a victory lap on the other side, going out and at his rally saying, look what I gave you. Look what these three justices that I appointed have given you and these wins for the right or for conservatives on the other side. But Democrats are absolutely going to message on that. You saw the president that day making comments saying we were trying to do things to help middle America. The Republicans did not want to help middle America. So, of course, um, that's the best way to handle a, a legal loss is trying to make a political gain. I mean, and there's a, a cynical view of it, like you said, is that maybe the, the White House never thought this was going to work out. And it was just always a messaging thing, um, which I guess could theoretically backfire. In the end, it's a broken campaign promise. He didn't mm-hmm. help you with your student loans. But we'll point to the MAGAs that that's, the, you know, mm-hmm. they love to use that. And he MAGA extremists. And, you know, the language the White House uses and the president uses. Um, but you heard the questioning from our Jackie Heinrich, who said to him, like, did you give millions of people this false hope? He says, no, it was real hope. It was the Republicans who snatched it away. So I would imagine that's going to be a theme they stick with. Um, there's this this federal judge in Louisiana says Biden administration officials can no longer have to limit their contact with social media companies. Can you explain what this dispute even came from and where it is. Yeah. So a lot of it, uh, it involves these two states, but also there were individual plaintiffs who said that they were censored. These were people who were speaking out about COVID restrictions and masks and the science, the medicine, the vaccines, all of it. And so essentially what they found was through discovery, look, there were all these communications between this administration um, and previous administration there, you know, with these tech companies wanting to censor ideas. And so that's what these two AGs in these states had said. This was a censorship enterprise. And what the judge has said, essentially, and it's a temporary as you know, injunction. So we'll see what the final decision is. But he's like, for now, these, these, these agencies, these administration officials cannot be talking with social media to tell them to take down posts or things that they disagree with or a disfavored position. And so um, the folks who were involved with this, and it was a number of physicians too, who were speaking out, they're calling it a big victory saying, this proves that we were being censored and that the government can't go around and do things 
through private actors that they themselves couldn't do when it comes to limiting First Amendment free speech. Yeah. I mean, their and their argument is, look, we didn't compel anybody to do anything, but mm -hmm. But, you when know, the government's if, calling exactly. you up, like when the G DOJ is calling you up and be like, you might want to take a look at that tweet. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how a business owner right. is going to respond to that, how they're going to feel. Yeah. Uh, former President Trump's second quarter fundraising numbers are in twice as much of a haul as his first quarter numbers. Um, are these are these indictments making him <laughs> making his campaign money? Listen, he was prescient about it before the first one came down out of New York, that state indictment there. He predicted that his numbers would go up if he was indicted. And with each one that comes, it seems to prove his point and, and give credence to his narrative that the establishment's after me, the deep state's after me. They're going to stop me um, legally if they can, because they can't stop me politically. So, Man, it seems to be working for him. I mean, politically, it is rallying people to him in new ways, and it forces his own rivals to do it, too. Everyone in the GOP field has to run to him and talk about whether they would pardon him or not. They have to talk about him. They have to talk about that this is a witch hunt, that this was not a fair investigation. I mean, so they're forced to do it, so it only benefits him politically. Listen, this is very serious legal trouble on some of these fronts. I mean, this is real jail time connected to this stuff, and we're still waiting. Could there be another federal indictment? Could there be indictments out of Georgia? So these are real things that are piling up. But for now, in the short term, the political payoff is definitely there for him. I mean, from who's from who we know has been interviewed by by people with the special counsel's office, Jack Smith's office. We know they're looking at election interference, mm -hmm. um, and that could be yet, an, an, which is which they're also looking at in Georgia efforts to overturn the the Trump Biden election. And how many cases are possibly going to be stacked up? Mm -hmm. potentially during an election year. Well, and that's the thing is think about if you've ever been involved with any legal situation mm -hmm. or any, like it is all consuming. I, it worries you. You're thinking about it. You got to plan if you're giving depositions, if you're going to give sworn testimony, like that takes a ton of prep time with attorneys that you just have to do it. And if you have three or four or five of these going at one time, that is a real imposition on your time, your psyche, your strength, your physical, mental strength, all these things. Um, I think in the case of President Trump, he feeds on this and he actually gets energy out in the fight. He's a fighter. That's what his supporters love about him. But the reality of juggling three or four or five trials at the same time you're running for president, that's a big drain. Yeah. Ron DeSantis has been certainly not gaining in, in, in the polls. Um, he put out this video basically attacking Donald Trump for his support of the queer community, mm -hmm. which I'm sure some – DeSantis supporters may agree with that attack, that line of attack, but it also, it seems like a very strange target in this day and age. Well, and when I saw it, I actually was confused because I thought, is this someone trolling the DeSantis campaign? Campaign? I really couldn't figure it out because I thought this is such a mixed message because it's sort of right. Taking this attack on President Trump that he's been too kind or too welcoming or too open to this particular community. Um, at a time when Republicans are trying to say that they're building a big tent and there's room for everybody. Um, I, I literally did not know what to make of the ad when I saw it. Yeah, I mean, it really does seem like for the, for the support you might gain with such a narrow line of attack, um, you're going to lose more mm -hmm. than that. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how there, it's there being are, digested. There are, more, there are more gay Republicans than there are virulently anti-gay Republicans. Right. I, I it, it just seemed very odd. You know, you think about every bit of messaging that you put out as part of a campaign. It's very well thought through. You've got all kinds of consultants. And, uh, I, you know, I, oftentimes, um, you know, you workshop this stuff. I don't know how much attention this one got or if they thought mm -hmm. this is something really different and cutting edge and we'll see how it goes. Yeah. I don't know. But the reaction, I'm not sure is what they were going for. Yeah. Shannon, I have to confront you about your cocaine at the White House. Oh, no. Hey, for the record, <laughs> the logs will show I was not there that day. Okay. Just to clear that. Logs can be scrubbed. That's true. That's true. I give you my word <laughs> okay. as a bream that I was not at the White House that day. Um, you've been at the White House. Mm -hmm. Describe where this, where the Coke was found, how accessible it is to people. I mean, it wasn't in somebody's office. No, and it was a more trafficked area where visitors would leave cell phones or personal items when they would be coming in to mm -hmm. go look around the White House. So you wonder, okay, was this a visitor who happened to have this on them panicked remember they had it like you would think you knew a bag of that size of cocaine if mm -hmm. you had it with you going into the white house did they panic and just ditch it there was it a staffer who also at some point this is a convenient drop i've got this in my bag i forgot about it i leave it here um there would be a lot of people but you listen as you said visitor logs can be scrubbed we trust that people are going to be transparent with us but also there's enormous security cameras 
um, all kinds of protective staff. The president wasn't there, so you would have a different level of protective staff at that point. There's not a whole lot of legal jeopardy here. It's a misdemeanor um, cocaine possession in Washington, D.C., I, I believe. It that, that tells that, you all you need to know about <laughs> D.C. and yeah, the Wild West that we have there. Um, besides the legal jeopardy, whoever whoever's coke this was, I imagine, is quaking in their boots. Panicking. Because if and when that name comes out, mm -hmm. they are very infamous for, right. for, for a while. Yeah. Um, Your employment situation yeah. is definitely in jeopardy. And from what we know right now, they're doing fingerprint and DNA testing to try to get some information off the bag. Shannon Bream did not definitively <laughs> have will, cocaine at the White I House can't, I will last Sunday. swear a sworn affidavit. I will sign it today. Okay. Shannon Bream, Fox News Sunday host. Good to see you. Thanks. You too. Thank you.